بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله النبي الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إخواني the great companion Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman Hudayfa ibn Yaman he narrates that the people would go to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they would ask him about the good things and they would ask him about the positive things but I would go to him and I would ask him about the trials and I would ask him about those those uh, evil things so that I could stay away from them why am I bringing you this hadith or why am I bringing you this statement of the companion, what he used to do? Because Ikhwani, as well as enjoining the good, we also find out from this hadith that it's necessary to know the evils so that we can stay away from it. Why do we need to study shirk? So that we can stay away from it. If you didn't know what shirk was, you'd fall into it. So the same thing is here, Ikhwani. This video now is a video Exposing those beer, exposing those charlatans, exposing those businessmen, exposing those con artists, exposing those perverts, exposing those people who they lead our brothers and sisters into shirk, they lead our brothers and sisters into disbelief because of the things that they do. All in the name of Islam. We're going to mention today, inshallah. How to spot one of these people? What are their signs? What are their traits? How do you know that this person who's come to my house now, what he is doing, this is not correct? How does a person become a magician? Just so that we know the things that these people do. The different levels of magic, etc. This, uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll touch briefly on this. And then I'm going to mention to you the evils of using these people, the evils of going to such a person. And so I hope that this will expose those evil people within our society. So that the people, they know they're evil, so they stay away from it. And they go to somebody who is not like this. So firstly, Ikhwani. The first thing, how do you know that this person, he is not following the Qur'an and the Sunnah when he is making Ruqya? If somebody comes to your house and or you go to somebody and he says to you what is the name of your mother and your father what's the name of your forefathers and he starts asking you the names of your lineage etc stay away from this person stay away from this person he needs to your, know your name so that he can contact you and he can communicate with you why does he need to know the name of your mother and your father why does he need to know the name of your father, your father's father and your, your grandparents and your lineage? Why does he need this knowledge? For the sake of saving time, I'm going to mention these people and say, stay away from them. So if he asks you, what's your name? What's your dad's name? What's your dad's dad's name? What's your auntie's name? Stay away from this person, avoid him like the plague. Secondly, if this person asks you, Give me an item of your clothing. Give me an item of your underwear. Give me a hair. Give me a piece of your jewelry. If he asks the sisters, sisters, give me a, an earring. Give me a bangle. Give me a bracelet. Give me a ring. Give me a necklace. Stay away from this person. Why? When you have those uh, police... Uh, police, you know, like police camera action, whatever. And the person is hiding in the woods. And they have a police dog. They have a police dog. Then subhanallah, what do they do? They always say to the police dog, look, you know, they give him a sniff of that man's shirt or something with his sweat on it. And then they just release the dog and the dog will go and find him amongst the woods because he has a trail. He has a scent. He has a trail. The same way, ikhwani. You give something and they won't ask you, you know, give me something obtuse, you know, give me a CD or something like this. No, they will ask for something which has your sweat on it 
or a piece of your clothing or like a hair etc and of course the Prophet والسلام, magic was done on him because he used to comb his beard and there was hair left on his comb and the person took the hair and they did magic on the hair or via the hair of the Prophet so if he asks you for anything do not go to this person if he comes to your house and he says can I have this you say no you can't have this get out of my house get out of my house commonly what they will do they will take a piece of uh, a piece of clothing and they will say give me a piece of clothing or a piece of fabric and they will measure it and they say okay this is eight inches and then they say if this gets bigger or if it gets smaller then you're afflicted and you will find that it was eight inches now it's gone to ten inches or it's now it's gone to two inches or three inches and it actually physically shrinks Ikhwani, get this person outside your house, kick him out, physically just get him out. If you find that he says to you, bring me some water and bring a knife. And then he says to you, now stab this water, stab this water. I've heard, Ikhwani, people who say, when I was stabbing this water, it felt like I was stabbing flesh. If he does anything like this, kick this fraudster out of your house if he comes to you and he's in your house and he sits down and now he starts but he's, and he starts mumbling something he starts mumbling or he's or you he starts talking or he starts saying weird and wonderful things which is clearly not quran which is clearly not adhkar get him out of your house immediately if you have to grab him by his beard and you throw him out throw him out because he is not calling on Allah Jalla wa ala. Rather he is calling on Iblis. Rather he is calling on the Shayateen. Get him out of your house. If Ikhwani, he comes to your house and he starts, SubhanAllah, I've had cases where these people have said to our sisters, if you want to get better, I need to rub this on your private parts. If you want to get better, I need to touch this part of your body. If you want to get better, then you need to take off your clothes and... Ugh, disgusting, Ikhwani, get him out of your house. If, if Ikhwani, he comes to your house and says, bring me a bottle of water. Put the bottle of water in the wardrobe. Put the bottle of water over there or here you go, open the cap. And when I say to you, quickly close the cap. You say, Are you crazy? You've come... You, you know, how does this, where is this from the sunnah? Where is this from the understanding of the companions? Where is this in the Qur'an? What are you doing? What are you upon? Ikhwani, this is shirk and what he is actually going to do, he says, well, I've caught the jinn now in this bottle, bottle him up and then put the bottle in your thing and in your wardrobe or somewhere quiet away. And as long as it's there, then this jinn is going to remain in this place. Other things that they might do. Other things that they might do. He's going to come to you and he's going to say, you know, here, take this taviz, rub it on your body. Rub this taviz on your body, this amulet, take this and rub it on your body. What effect is rubbing a piece of paper going to have on your illness? Ask yourself, where has your intellect gone? What effect is this going to have? Just the other day, Somebody contacted me and said, somebody gave me a, uh, an amulet. We opened the amulet. There was a square in there and in the middle of the square it said Iblis. Ikhwani, what is this about? And don't think because the man walks in and he's got a mushaf, he's carrying a Quran. Don't think that he is pious. Don't think because he has a beard, he is pious. I was contacted by a sister who told me that her own father was doing magic upon her. And I said, tell me. And I wanted to know, tell me, does your father look like a practicing person? She said, yes, everybody thinks he's a practicing person. But we opened his mushaf and in his mushaf, in the middle of his mushaf, there was magic. There was magic, weird and wonderful drawings, pictures of me and my spouse and my sisters and their spouses and all sorts of Symbols symbolizing split these people apart and they had all been divorced. Ikhwani, on the outside he looks so practicing. 
he's got a big beard and they call him Maulana Saab and they call him Sheikh Saab and they call him Haji Saab and they call him this and they call him that. I call him a fraudster and I call him if he knows what he is doing then he has left the fold of Islam because he has only reached this station by doing acts of worship and acts of, of obedience to the shayateen. If he says to you now, okay, close your eyes and you, you're going to see something and when you see it, catch it. Or close your eyes and you're going to see something and when you see it, slap it. If he says any of this, Ikhwani, get this person outside of your house. Because why? Why, why, why? I've said it before and I'll say it again. Ruqya is transparent. The Prophet ﷺ, he told us that I'm leaving you on a path, this deen. Its night is like its day. Everything is clear. Everything is illuminated. Its night is like its day. There is no darkness. Ikhwani, Rukya is transparent. You look through one side, you can see the other side. You look from the top, you can see the bottom. Why? Because the person comes, he sits in front of you, he opens the Qur'an and he starts reciting from the Qur'an. He begins with Adhkar. He begins by praising Allah Jalla wa ala, sending peace and blessings on the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all of the Adhkar are recognizable. He is mentioning the oneness of Allah. He is mentioning the greatness of Allah. There is nothing dodgy. He is not speaking in any other languages. Completely transparent. He hasn't asked me to stand on one leg and go and sacrifice this thing in that corner over there. He hasn't told me to bring him a red frog. He hasn't told me to bring him a, a rat's leg. He hasn't told me to do anything stupid. He's told me, sit, listen, focus and put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ruqya is transparent. If somebody is doing Ruqya according to Quran wa Sunnah, it is transparent. Ikhwani, if he comes and he does any of these weird things, this person is what is known as a magician. He is a sahir. He is somebody who is indulging in magic. Or at the very least, he is innovating in this religion. And by innovating in this religion, you are not going to get any shifa, you are not going to get any cure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever. There is no cure in any innovations. Every single innovation is a misguidance and every misguidance is going to lead you to the hellfire. So Ikhwani, how can we expect or hope to get cure from something which is leading us to the hellfire? We stick to Quran, we stick to Adhkar and it is absolutely straightforward and transparent. I'm going to mention and it pains me to say, but before people come to Iraqi, they normally go out of their lack of knowledge. They normally go to a Peer Saab. They normally go to one of these charlatans. They normally go to some Darbar and say, Ya Sheikh, Ya Peer, cure me or heal me. And then they do weird and wonderful things. I'm going to expose what some of these people have done. There was a sister, and it makes me angry when I talk about this subject. Because these are our brothers and our sisters who are suffering, who are vulnerable, and then these are those evil people who are then taking advantage of the suffering of our brothers and their vulnerabilities and of our sisters as well. A man came and I said, no, the sister told me. And I said, sister, tell me, how much money have you spent going to these people? How much money have you spent going to these peers, these fakirs and these wannabes? How much money have you spent? She said three to four thousand pounds. Three to four thousand pounds. And I got myself into so much debt because of these people. And one of these people, one of these filthy individuals came to me and said, as part of the treatment, I need to rub a specific cream onto your private parts. You are not upon the sunnah, rather you are a khabith and you are awliya of shaitan. And you are taking advantage of our sisters. And you are taking advantage of our sisters. May Allah destroy you. Another person came and he said, what you are suffering with is so bad, I cannot deal with it. You need to go to a Hindu. You need to go to a Hindu. 
and he sent my sister in Islam, your sister in Islam, he sent her to a kafir. He sent her to a kafir. And this kafir sold her a bracelet for 600 pounds and said, this is going to benefit you. Where are the Muslims? Where are the Muslims? Where are our men? When these are our sisters and they are being violated in this way. Where are they? Another one comes and he starts reciting or he starts doing his routine. And then he starts to flirt with the sister. And he starts to come onto the sister. And he starts to make a pass with the sister. Subhanallah. This is the reality of these people. This is their reality. Ikhwani, if they don't do any of this, then enough is that they come and they give you a taviz. They give you an amulet. And this is not from our religion. Ask. I don't care how many people will say, well, this scholar allowed it and that scholar allowed it. We do not follow the scholars without the proofs. قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Say, bring your proofs and your evidences if you are truthful. Which one of the companions allowed Qur'an? Which one of the companions said, you know what, you can wear a taviz, you can wear an amulet? Which one of the companions allowed this? And what was his evidence? If you bring it, then bring your evidence and say, this is the evidence that he was, he was basing his ijtihad upon. Ikhwani, enough is that if it is just Qur'an in this amulet, you could have gone on to Google, typed in Surah Fatiha, and you could have printed it off, you could have put it into an amulet, and you could have put it around your own neck. Instead, you paid £200 for this. Like a monthly subscription, he says, you know, give me £200, and then this one wears out, and then you go for the next one. And you know, subhanAllah, there you go. He's got a lifetime subscription. Because now, you don't trust in Allah, you trust in this piece of paper. You trust in this black string which you wear around your neck or around your waist. Ikhwani, all of these things are impermissible. Wearing an amulet is not permissible. Putting something over your door, thinking that it's going to benefit you, is not permissible. And these people, this is what they will do. This is what they will do. I had a sister ring me and she said to me, my brother is suffering. My brother is suffering with this and I think it's this and this and this. I said, okay, alhamdulillah, we'll come down, no problem, inshallah. Then the sister said, Akhi, you know something happened like five years ago and I went to a beer and I didn't know in those days. I, something happened five years ago and, and I was cured, you know, I got better. I got better. But you know, subhanallah, I just don't feel right. I just don't feel right. So I said to the sister, I said, sister, let me tell you something. When these evil people, when they commit their shirk, when they do their kufr, acts of kufr, and they do all of their magic and all of this rubbish. I said, this will not lead to a lasting cure. And a brother gave me a very good example, which I'm going to give to you. If a dog is barking, and the dog is barking very, very loud, and you throw the dog some meat, is the dog going to stop barking? The answer is yes. The dog is going to stop barking. But then, when the dog has completed his meal, and he gets hungry again, He's going to bark louder. He's going to be more fierce and more ferocious than he was before because he knows that if I do this, they are going to throw me my meat. The dog is the shayateen. They want you to commit acts of kufr, acts of shirk. How is it that when the Christians, they do their exorcisms and the Buddhas, Buddhisms and Buddhists and all of these people, Kuffar, how is it that their exorcisms work? Because when they go there and they say, Oh, Holy Father and Spirit and all of this rubbish. When they go there and they call upon others besides Allah Jalla wa Ala, then the, shayateen is ha the shaytan is happy now. These people have committed shirk. Khalas. I've got my meat. I've barked. I've got my meat and I'm happy. And the same thing when this bead sab comes to you. And nowadays I warn you, because now they know, they're becoming, you know, they're becoming advanced. The Peer know, we can't call ourselves Peer anymore because of the evil connotations attached with that. Because of the way that people have exposed Peer like us. So now they will say, I am a Sheikh, I am an Alim, I am this and I am that. Or they will say, you know, people call me Peer, but I'm not a Peer. So subhanAllah, they are con artists and they are deceiving you and their deception is upon deception upon deception. So like I said, they will come and they will do these actions. 
And I was explaining to the sister. And then you throw them the meat, you throw the dog the meat. So he commits this act of shirk. He calls upon Iblis or under his breath or he, he calls upon the Prophet ﷺ and asks him for help. And then the shaitan leaves. And you think, wow, you know, I'm cured. I'm cured. Surely this is the correct path. I said, but sister, take it from me. It's going to come back to you and it's going to come back worse and it's going to come back stronger. And all of you people who have been to Abir, you will agree with me and you will testify on this that I went to Abir, but you know what? I just don't feel right afterwards. I don't feel right. I see things or this or this or this or this. There's always a side effect, negative side effects. Anything which is deviated is going to have its problems. So I said to the sister, sister, while I'm reciting on your brother, you come and you sit next to him. So the sister comes in and I start the recitation. Two minutes in, two minutes in, the brother is absolutely fine. The sister is going wild. The sister is going wild. And she is having a huge reaction. So we, so now my intention is now, my focus has come off the brother and I'm thinking, SubhanAllah, we've got a big one on our hands. So I'm starting and I've continued the recitation. Now I'm just focusing on the sister and reciting, reciting, reciting. Eventually, Ikhwani, it turns out that the jinn says, Sheikh Abdullah, Sheikh Abdullah from Pakistan, he sent me. And I said, and you know, we really, uh, with the recitation, the jinn was really suffering. And I said to him, He's a magician, isn't he? And he said, yeah, he's a magician and he sent me. And I'm a Muslim, I didn't want to come, but he did this pact and he made this evil pact and he did this action and that action and now I don't have an, a, a choice and I'm actually bound to this person. And his name is Abdullah and he's doing these acts of worship and these acts of submission to the shayateen. Ikhwani, doesn't matter what his name is. His name can be Muhammad. But if he is doing these things, he is a kafir. Full stop. And I'm not saying everybody is a kafir, etc. But I'm saying those people who do these acts of submission and acts of obedience to the shayateen, they have left the fold of Islam. They are indulging in magic. Because Allah Jalla wa'ala mentions, فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ And they taught the people magic. But then Allah says, وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةً فَلَا تَكْفُرُ Allah subhanahu wa mentions how magic was sent down as a trial and the two angels of Babil, Harut and Marut, they began to teach the people the magic. But before they said anything of teaching them the magic, they said, إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةً Indeed, we are a fitna. So do not disbelieve by learning this magic. Ikhwani, having any portion of magic, any knowledge of magic whatsoever, this is an act of disbelief and learning magic, you have left, your, left the fold of Islam. Allah says, وَلَا بِئْسَ مَا شَرَوْ بِهِ أَنفُسَهُمْ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ What an evil price they have sold themselves for, if only they knew. What an evil price they have sold themselves for, if only they knew. They have got a small gain in the dunya. And they do make a gain. One Davi is 200 pounds, 150 pounds, 100 pounds, and they give 20 out in a day. Cash money. Cash money. Subhanallah. And you see these beads and you think, Subhanallah, where did you get this money from? You're claiming from the government on one side, and on the other side, you're driving a 50,000 pound car. You don't have a job. Subhanallah. So, Ikhwani, we notice from this that if you want a cure, and you want a lasting cure. The only way to do, to do this is to go on the correct path of the Qur'an and of the Sunnah. This is extremely, extremely important. Extremely important. And these people, Ikhwani, there's no love. I don't have any love for these people. Because you sit there and you might say, why is he so harsh? Why is he so harsh on these people? Ikhwani, if you had to deal with and you had to pick up the pieces after these people, then wallahi you would hate them just as much as I do for the sake of Allah Jalla wa'ala because of the disbelief that they commit because of the shirk that they commit because of leading people astray charging them so much money Ikhwani we find paste, paper, pieces of paper and on there are written the ayahs of, of the Qur'an and the people say look it's just Qur'an on this paper and I say smell it and it smells of urine 
And the magician has urinated on this paper before he wrote the ayat of, of the Qur'an on this paper. So many different things. So many different things. Or he's calling, there is an ayah of the Qur'an and then underneath that he's written and he's calling upon this jinn and that jinn and he mentions them by name. But because we don't have the knowledge, we're not able to distinguish. And I ask you, and I ask you this, go away and ask yourself this. Why is it that when you go and you have a taviz, you know they sew it shut and they, and they wrap it in, in sellotape and it's, subhanAllah, you think this is diamonds inside here, the way they have protected it. Because they don't want you to open it. They don't want you to open it. Because by opening it, you will destroy the magic. Because you see it and you say, this is kufr. And you destroy it. And this will remove the effects of that magic. So, ikhwani, I hope, I hope that we have just touched the surface. I've only, wallahi, I've only just touched the surface on these people. And their, and their deceit, and their lies, and their deception, and their kufr, and their shirk. We've only touched the surface. But like I said, if any person comes to your house and he does anything except for recite Qur'an, except for uh, read the adhkar from the sunnah, except for ask you about your daily lifestyle, how is your life, because maybe the, the raqi is trying to you know, ascertain, maybe it's a mental issue, maybe there's other factors at play here. You know, this is okay if they ask you about your life. And, but the second he asks you to give him something, the second that he starts asking, asking the names of your fathers and your forefathers, the second that he starts doing weird and wonderful things, telling you to look up at the light and you're going to see this and you're going to see that. Get this person out of your house. Call somebody who is upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah because this is the only lasting cure. And if you are, you know, you feel better because of what he's doing, know that at some stage in your life, it's going to come back and it's going to bite you and it's going to bite you harder and more viciously than it was previously. Just like with the example of the dog. Okay, I want to mention now, Ikhwani, just uh, quickly uh, about a couple of cases which I was dealing with. Um, a brother requested that we mention about psychological, uh, psychological illnesses and Rukya. What's the link? This is a big topic, but inshallah, we're going to keep it very, very brief. If you speak to a brother who has knowledge of Rukya and he's also in the psychiatric field, he will tell you, and he works with you know, people who have mental issues and he works in the mental home, he will tell you if this brother has knowledge of Rukya as well and knowledge of the deen. He will tell you, you know what, 80% or 70% of these people in this place, there's nothing wrong with them except that there's jinn possession or magic done on these people. I personally feel, I personally feel that a lot of Raqis nowadays, they are too quick to jump on the bandwagon of this is a psychological illness. And I ask those brothers, Akhi, if it's a psychological illness, are you saying that Qur'an will not benefit this person? Are you limiting the shifa or the benefits of the Qur'an simply to jinn, magic, sihr? This is not the approach that me personally, I'm not saying this is a correct approach, but me personally, this is not the approach that I take. Because subhanAllah, you will find, and, the, and you find that yes, yeah, some people are just, uh, yani they are just um, attention seekers. And they want attention, so they put on, I'm suffering from this and I'm suffering with this. And again, like I mentioned in the previous video, they've self-diagnosed themselves with magic or jinn. There's no magic or no jinn. But because of that, psychologically now, they have given themselves this problem. But subhanAllah, Subhanallah, there are valid cases where a person is afflicted with all of these things and then they come to you and you recite on them and, they, and you don't have or they don't get a reaction. How do you know that the jinn hasn't left before he came to you? And this is something that happens. The shayateen, the jinn, if they've got a jinn problem, he leaves, they go to this person and then they come back, you know, they leave the raqi and then the jinn enters them again. Ikhwani, it's a very big topic I don't think that I can do it justice in five minutes or six minutes, but I'm just going to mention that there is a very, very strong link. There is a very strong link between psychological illnesses, sihar and jinn possession. There is a very, very strong link. And you have to always understand, we live in a world where people, the first thing that they'll do is they'll go to the doctors. And the doctors, ikhwani, the psychologists, by their own admission, they are only... They have only, you know, at the embryonic stages of understanding how the brain works. If you say to a person, this theory, prove it to me. Prove to me your theory is correct. And I encourage you to challenge the psychiatrists. 
I encourage you to challenge the doctors. Why? We are people who we base our actions and our religion and our situation on proofs. We worship Allah with proofs. The Quran is a proof, etc, etc. So don't think that just because I've gone to the doctor, then subhanAllah he knows everything. This man denies the existence of Allah. Do you think that he is going to accept the existence of jinn and magic? If he can deny the Creator, Rabbul Samawati wal Ard, wa ma baynahuma, do you think that he's going to accept the jinn and magic? So, Ikhwani, I challenge you, or I encourage you, challenge these people and say, you know what, you've put me on this drug, you've put me on katayapin, which is clinically proven with the permission of Allah Jalla wa Ala to shut down organs, to, uh, you know, to reduce lifespan, to sedate the brain and turn a person into a vegetable. You've put me on this medicine. Based on what proof? Based on what evidence do you put me on such a strong, medic, uh, on such a strong dose of this medication? Ikhwani subhanAllah. But then on the other side of the coin, we have to be just. We have to be fair. That there are people who they will say, I'm suffering with jinn and magic and this and that. But subhanAllah, they are suffering from a mental issue. They are suffering from a mental issue. But, like I said, other Raqis will say to you, yeah, very quickly, I think it's mental, I think it's this, and I think it's that. And I'm not saying all of them. But I think the safer option is to say, look, regardless of what you are suffering from, the Qur'an is a shifa. So I hope that this uh, lecture has been a benefit, inshallah. A, in exposing those people. B, in giving you some things to look out for. Some things to look out for. You know this person comes and he just doesn't look right. Or he's carrying this, or he's doing this, or he's doing this, or he's doing this. He's doing this, he's doing that. Get these people out of your house. So inshallah we'll be more vigilant against these con artists. We'll be more vigilant against these magicians because this is what they are in reality. At some degree or another degree, they are magicians. We will also, insha'Allah, we've also, insha'Allah, exposed the fact that we don't need Davies and this and that. Use your intellect. Use your intellect. If you go to a doctor and he gives you a prescription and you put the prescription in your top pocket, is that going to benefit you? No. You need to use the prescription the way the doctor has prescribed. And for Allah is the highest example. The Quran is this medicine. But if you put it on your top pocket or you hang it around your neck or you hang it around your, on your wall, is it going to benefit you? The answer is no. Did the Prophet ﷺ use it this way? The answer is no. Did his companions use it this way? The answer is no. Then the question that I pose to you, why are you using it in this way? If they didn't do it, why are you using it this way? On top of that, inshallah, we've scratched the surface of uh, magic and uh, also uh, the issue of uh, psychological issues and jinn possession etc inshallah maybe next time uh, if you think if your brothers and sisters think it's beneficial please leave some comments inshallah um, about what we should discuss next time maybe we can talk in more detail uh, about psychological illnesses etc or maybe we can get a brother with more knowledge of this inshallah to speak on this topic and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us and to from you and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to expose those evil people and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to humiliate them in the dunya and also on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, benefit us from that which we have heard and I ask you brothers and sisters to please spread this and to expose those people in your area advise them privately first and say listen what you are upon is not correct if they continue with this then expose them and make their mischief plain so that insha'Allah the people will stay away from those people and rather come to the people of Sunnah. Wa akhiru da'awana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.